Part 2 Chapter 8 Miss Peavy was giving a tea party. The preparations had begun yesterday morning. The Crown Derby tea service had been taken out of the Ormolu cabinet in the tiny drawing room and washed by Miss Peavy's own hands. Such an operation could not be entrusted, of course, to Ethel, with, miraculously, not a single resulting breakage. In the afternoon, Miss Peavy, her head swathed in a check duster, her small body in a voluminous overall, and her hands encased in white cotton gloves two sizes too large for them, had superintended Ethel's turning out of the drawing room with such help as experience and superior strength had to afford. Ethel was only fourteen and heavy of hand. She lived at the last cottage of the village proper, the nearest one to Miss Peavy's, and described herself proudly as Miss Peavy's help. She had been Miss Peavy's help ever since she was twelve, nine to eleven of a morning and afternoons when wanted special. And in some ways, Miss Peavy thought secretly, she was more of a hindrance. But between the two of them, the job was done at last to Miss Peavy's satisfaction. Then, on the morning of the party itself, there had been a great baking of cakes. Supervised by Ethel, in the capacity of critic, admirer, and Hermes. Now, fetch me the baking powder, Ethel. The small tin at the left-hand end of the middle shelf. No, the middle shelf, dear, the left-hand end. No, no, the small tin. Oh, never mind, I'll get it myself. Oh, it ain't in that tin, miss. Not now, it ain't. It was empty, and I put the cloves in it. I thought it'd come in handy for the cloves, like, so I put them in it, miss. Well, where is the baking powder? Oh, there ain't none, miss. Dear, dear, you ought to have told me that before. Really, you ought, Ethel. Now, you'll have to run up to Mrs. Dinville and get a tin. Uh, sevenpence, uh, and now my hands are all... Um, where is my purse, dear? I think I left it... Um, no, I didn't. Oh, really, Ethel, you should have told me, you know. Miss Peavy had made a chocolate cake, iced with chocolate, an orange cake, iced with orange, and a great quantity of rock buns and Eccles cakes, not iced at all. And only the rock buns had been what you could really call burnt, and those not irrevocably. At least three quarters, with judicious pairing, were made presentable. A most successful morning. It was to be quite an important tea party. Mrs. Tor and Quanian were coming. Janet Wopsworthy, of course. Gwynifred Rattery, with the Major, if she could persuade him. Mr. Tor had promised faithfully to look in, if he could find the time. And Ivy Chatford and her husband were actually coming over from Merchester specially. If only poor Mrs. Bickley was still alive. Only Mrs. Hatton Hampstead had definitely refused. And Madeleine Bourne, of course, but she refused all invitations nowadays, it seemed. Miss Peavy was secretly relieved that she was not coming. How lucky it was, such a lovely day. Take it all round, Miss Peavy really did think that May was the loveliest month of all. Spring, gloriously fulfilled, budding into summer. But no, they would not have tea in the garden. It would not be fair on the Crown Derby, and Ethel with the tray. Fortunately, there would be plenty to talk about. None of those awkward pauses in the conversation that Miss Peavy so dreaded. For never had there been such a year in the history of Wyvern's Cross. Two marriages and one death. And Mr. Davy's new book, All About the Neighbourhood, no, there would be no lack of conversational fodder. There would be gossip, too, of course, bound to be, with Quanian and her mother there. Miss Peavy hoped they would not get too libelous, but really, gossip had never seemed so rife in Wyvern's Cross before, and the most scandalous things, with but the slenderest foundations, well, no foundations really at all. Miss Peavy would take no part in it herself, nor encourage it. That was her firm rule. 
but he would hardly be able to check it without being quite rude. And anyhow, anything was better than those awkward pauses. The problem of Dr. Bickley had been exercising Miss Peavy terribly in this connection. Ought she to ask him or not? If she did not, would it not look terribly pointed? On the other hand, if she did, even though Madeleine Bourne was not coming, and what would Mr. Tor? Everybody was talking about Dr. Bickley not having been inside the church since his wife died so tragically. Poor Mrs. Bickley! Who would ever have thought? In the end, Miss Peavy did not ask him. After all, it was a feminine tea party, really, with such men as might come under specific feminine proprietorship. No, there was really no need to ask Dr. Bickley at all. At four o'clock punctually, they began to arrive. Miss Wapsworthy was the first, very bright, in a purple straw hat with pink roses and mauve silk. Good afternoon, Janet. So nice of you. Isn't it a perfect day? Really, we might almost have... But I'd made all the arrangements, you see, and it is so... Would you like to wash your hands? Thank you, Adela, returned Miss Wapsworthy with some asperity. I washed them before I came out. There was more in this exchange than met the ignorant eye. Miss Peavy's cottage was half a mile outside the village and stood at the foot of the steep slope which began where the hamlet ended. Miss Wapsworthy's cottage, at the other end of Wyvern's Cross, stood on flat land. Miss Peavy, therefore, had a gravitational water supply to her cottage from a spring halfway up the hill above her. In the village itself there was no pipe water, and Miss Wapsworthy's cottage shared this disability. Her water supply was a great comfort to Miss Peavy. Her soul, heated by other and frictional causes, laved gratefully in its cooling stream. Miss Peavy's cottage alone, among all the others, possessed a water closet. Why, even at the hall they had to... Miss Peavy never thought of her water closet as such, but always as indoor sanitation. I invariably, added Miss Wapsworthy pointedly, wash my hands before I go out to tea. She glanced down at her grey cotton gloves, as if to imply that she had come prepared further to keep the members in question, free from all contamination while in this particular locality. Yes, yes. Yes, of course. Well, then, shall we just stroll round the garden till the others come? My gloxinias really are beginning to... Miss Peavy temporarily tethered the ends of the tool scarf. The two ladies walked in the garden. Half an hour later, the affair was in full swing. So far, the gathering was entirely feminine. Not even the dubious masculinity of Mr. Tor was there to leaven it. The Chatfords had not yet put in an appearance. Voices shrill and voices ladylike slashed the atmosphere in vivid ribbons. Characters came up, were seen through, and retired conquered. Reputations littered the ground like snowflakes. Scarcely to her knees, Mrs. Tor was burbling in shocked contentment. Really? I think I know what my husband would say if I appeared in our church like that and in a cathedral. Really, you'd think she'd see that as the wife of one of the canons she has a position to keep up, wouldn't you? And fifty if she's a day, nodded Miss Wapsworthy. Disgusting. Really, Mrs. Tor, said a lady from Merchester, one of Miss Peavy's childhood friends who had married socially beneath the cathedral set, but considerably above its purses. Really? You don't mean to say you could actually see her... her... Even among ladies, real ladies, the existence of such things must only be hinted. When she knelt down, replied Mrs. Tor with solemnity, I could see them distinctly, distinctly. I must look myself next Sunday, said the lady from Merchester with as much gusto as if that had not been her sex at all. 
edged with lace, added Mrs. Tor, as though that were just about the last enormity, as if one could worship the Almighty properly when edged with lace. Even Miss Peavy wondered what the Almighty's views could be on such a frivolous example of his creations. In a corner, Quanian and Gwynifred were discussing men. Oh, no, Quanian, Miss Rattery was saying, with a horrified avidity of the British Virgin on matters of sex. I can't believe that. Really, I can't. He did, though, on a bright. Oh, our Sam's a naughty lad. But where did you let him? I wanted to see if he would. Well... It seems to me you're as much to blame as he is, then, pronounced Miss Rattery fastidiously. Who's blaming anyone? retorted Quanian with devastating impartiality. Having achieved her object, which was the simple one of shocking Gwynifred, she turned her attention to the group of her elders round the tea table. They were now plucking the down of virtue from the perfectly respectable daughter of a Merchester schoolmaster who had been seen at a local cinema with a married man. As Quanian unfortunately did not know the young woman in question, the gathering heap of white plumage at the lady's feet did not interest her. She turned back to Gwynifred and yawned without concealment. Lord, I wish Ivy had come. This is too dull for words. Haven't seen old Ivy for years. Hardly since she married. Have you? Yes. A saw her in Merchester about a fortnight ago. Ask her how she liked being married, Quanian asked with an obscene wink. No, A did not, reposted Gwynifred, who invariably grew more affected in proportion as she was really shocked. Got a nice house, haven't they? Quanian said enviously. Bill Chatford must be doing pretty well. Not half a bad little nest he's been able to feather for his birdie. Of course, he's been saving like mad all the years he lived here. How does Ivy like living in Merchester? Oh, quite well, I think. Gwynifred drank a little tea. The forefinger of her right hand was tucked so far under the others that no one could possibly have accused it of being crooked. Quanian also drank a little tea and crooked her own little finger outrageously. When she saw Gwynifred eyeing it with an expression of intense pain, she spluttered and had to put her cup down. Quanian had a simple sense of humour. Well, has Teddy proposed to you yet, Gwynifred? she asked next. Baiting Miss Rattery was one of the few amusements that Wyvern's Cross had to offer Miss Tor. And Gwynifred being twenty-four, while Miss Tor herself was only nineteen, well, practically twenty now, and Gwynifred, moreover, intensely disapproving of her twenty-four dignity, being assailed by nineteen impudence, and yet quite unable effectively to fight back, all added a not unpleasant spice to the entertainment. Quanian, you do say such things, lamented Miss Rattery now, but she was ingenuous enough to be thoroughly confused by the question. Quanian observed her companion's blush with pleasure and set about deepening it. Well, has he kissed you again lately? What do you mean, again? Since he did when he took you away to give you those cuttings at their tennis party last summer. You remember? He didn't. My dear Gwynifred, don't try to put it on with me begged Miss Tor, enjoying herself mightily. Gwynifred's blush was getting quite interesting now. Never seen anything quite so obvious in my life. He carefully takes you out of sight instead of bringing the things to you. You're away about an hour and come back looking all worked up, both of you. And then you tell me. <laughs> oh, Lord, Gwynifred, I may be younger than you, but I wasn't born yesterday. Of course he kissed you. That he did not. I never gave him the chance, horrid little man. Oh, ho, so he tried, and you turned him down, cried Miss Tor in high delight. Poor Teddy. I only wish it had been me. 
I don't think he's a horrid little man at all. Well, he is, said Gwynifred quite vindictively. Poor old Teddy, gloated Quanion. Well, now, I do call that rough luck on him. When everyone knows he only killed his wife to be free to marry you, Gwynifred. Well, well, well. Quanion, my dear Gwynifred, don't pretend to be so shocked. Of course Teddy killed his wife. And I, for one, said Miss Tor judicially, don't blame him. But if I'd been the coroner, I'd have asked Master Teddy quite a lot of questions. Quanion, how can you say such things? What? You don't mean you really think he didn't? I think it's simply horrible of you. Then I'm not the only one that's horrible. Mother's horrible. Father's horrible. Half Wyvern's cross is horrible. I don't believe it for a minute. Gwynifred was so indignant that Quanion was driven almost to defend these preposterous misstatements. She hastily found a grain of truth to inject into the foundations of her imaginative edifice. Well, I can tell you this then. Father does think there must have been something funny about Mrs. Bickley's death because he says he just can't swallow that story at the inquest of her being a drug fiend. Well, it is a bit tall, isn't it? Teddy really ought to have invented something better. But he doesn't want to make a fuss because he doesn't want a scandal in the parish, so there. But Miss Bickley's sister confirmed the evidence about that and her brother too. Oh, he got round them somehow. I expect they're all in it. Nonsense! Gwynifred was really angry. Eh? I think it's beastly to go round saying things like that, Quanion. You're, you're a little beast. All right, then. It was Quanion's turn to become annoyed. Call me a liar. I'll jolly well show you. Mother? New no, Quanion. Mother? Quanion, you're not to be quiet. Mother! Mrs. Tor turned in her chair. What is it, dear? Gwynifred's calling me a liar because I told her father wasn't satisfied with the verdict on Mrs. Bickley last year. You remember what he said? Dead silence cut off the chatter, as if it had been sliced off with a knife. The women looked at each other almost furtively. Uh, no, dear, twittered Mrs. Tor after a long pause. I don't remember... Yes, you do. He said, that will do, dear. But the plucking of the schoolmaster's daughter was resumed only half-heartedly. A chicken, however young and tender, becomes poor fare when a whole banquet, rich, luscious, almost infinite, has been waved for a second beneath one's nose. The last few poor feathers were ripped off mechanically, and four hungry faces confronted Mrs. Tor. In the corner, Gwynifred and Quanion watched their elders not deceived. Miss Peavy, said Quanion dulcetly, you were telling me about your gloxinias the other day. Make Gwynifred and I go and look at them. Yes, do, dear. There, um, you'll find them. Are you sure you've quite finished? Gwynifred, I don't believe you tried one of my, um, fresh-baked this morning, I promise you. Quanion, won't you, um... No, thank you. We've quite finished, really. Come along, Gwynifred. The two girls went out amid the grateful looks of the others. Tact radiated from Quanion's lanky form as she slouched towards the door. Outside she turned to Gwynifred. Of course, they wouldn't say anything while we were in there. But if we went and admired the flowers in that bed there, just under that window, and kept out of sight of the peavy and the wop, well, don't you think that was a pretty bright idea, Gwynifred? Quanion, I think you're horrible. I wouldn't do anything so mean. But she followed Quanion's stealthy progress towards the window nevertheless. Inside, Mrs. Tor was gracefully giving way before inexorable but practically silent pressure. How naughty of Quanion! Really, what a thing to say! 
Why wasn't Mr. Tor satisfied? asked Mrs. Wopsworthy, who favoured blunt methods. Really? said Miss Peavy anxiously. Do you think we should? Isn't it rather, um, I mean... Well, what do you mean, Adela? asked Miss Wopsworthy. Well, the verdict was accidental death, wasn't it? And if anyone wasn't satisfied... I mean, said Miss Peavy bravely, isn't it hinting at something quite dreadful? Miss Wopsworthy looked round the little circle of intent faces. Well, and haven't we all been hinting in our thoughts for the last year at something rather dreadful? She said in a harsh, jerky voice. Of course we have. And not one of us had the courage to put it into words. Well, I will. I agree with Mr. Tor. I'm not satisfied either. Her tone was a challenge. It's my opinion that Julia Bickley's death was not an accident at all, that she deliberately killed herself because of, well, we all know what. It was past five before Ivy and her husband arrived. Mr. Chatford explained precisely that he had been kept later than he expected by an important client and had been unable to drive Ivy over earlier. Ivy, who had hardly been seen in Wyvern's Cross since her marriage, had altered very little. Her fragile figure showed no signs of rounding, and she did not seem to have gained in confidence. Her blue eyes returned constantly to her husband after everything she said as if seeking his approval for it, and the slight look of timidity in them increased rather than diminished. She was obviously a little afraid of him. Only her clothes gave any outward indication of the change in her position. The Ridgeways were not well off, and Ivy had always dressed very simply, in tweeds or woolens or homemade little summer frocks. Now she looked rather out of place for a cottage tea party, in a black satin frock with long, tight sleeves and a close-fitting black Baku hat, which, though small and apparently simple, contrived at the same time to be dashing, and sat with an air of incongruity above her rounded, childish face. The ensemble quite certainly did not reflect Ivy's own taste, and one gathered that Mr. William Chatford not only considered that his wife's clothing should stand for a sign of the position in life which he had reached, but had no small part himself in choosing them. Ivy looked more like Bond Street than Merchester. Miss Peavy, who had not seen her at all since the wedding, welcomed her warmly. Ivy had always been a favourite of hers, and kisses were exchanged. Ethel was summoned to bring fresh tea, and Mr. Chatford, as the only male man, ensconced in the chair of honour. Do try one of those Eccles cakes while you're waiting, dear, beamed Miss Peavy. I made them myself this morning. Thank you, Miss Peavy. I'd love to. And with half a dozen pairs of feminine eyes watching her enviously, Ivy pulled off her small hands the most expensive-looking pair of gloves ever seen in Wyvern's Cross. Ivy's looking so well confided Mrs. Tor to Mr. Chatford in tones of congratulation, and so smart and pretty, really I hardly knew her. A mother of mother's bricks, confided Quanion to Gwynifred. The two girls had returned to the house on the Chatford's arrival. This hat, said Ivy, in answer to a question from the lady from Merchester. Oh, haven't you seen it before, Mrs. Dunsford? I got it in Paris. On our honeymoon, William gave it to me. She glanced at her husband. A model, amplified Mr. Chatford with obvious satisfaction. The word came oddly in his precise enunciation. Charming, pronounced the company dutifully. There was a pause. Nobody spoke. The pause grew awkward. Miss Peavy looked to Mrs. Tor in appeal. Mrs. Tor did not see her. The pause seemed to have lasted for years. Miss Peavy plunged. So lucky, 
You didn't come five minutes earlier, Mr. Chatford, she tittered with nervousness. We were just, um, probably quite libelous. I expect you'd have had us all arrested. Really, said Mr. Chatford politely. Then I suppose it would be indiscreet to ask what you were discussing. Oh, very, that is. I know when ladies get together the conversation does tend to verge on slander, Mr. Chatford observed humorously. I trust I was not your subject. Oh, no, good gracious, no. It was, oh, quite different. Just silly village talk gossip, you know. I'm sure we were all terribly shocked as it was to learn that poor Mrs. Bickley had taken to... But that's very different from suggesting that... <laughs> Miss Peavy broke off with a little squeak of dismay, conscious of six pairs of horrified eyes regarding her. What had she... Mr. Chatford, however, appeared quite unhorrified. He chose another Eccles cake with some care and took a modified bite of it. Oh, yes he said, with interest nothing beyond the polite. So you were talking about Mrs. Bickley? Very sad. Very sad indeed. Though rather past history now. Still, as you say, very curious too. Oh, Mrs. Tor, Ivy said hurriedly, I've been meaning to ask you and Quarnian over to tea. You must come soon. Of course, we're only just straight, but, um, now, what about next Wednesday? It was arranged that Quarnian and Mrs. Tor should go to tea with Ivy next Wednesday. The conversation skated imperceptibly farther from Mrs. Bickley. Soon afterwards, Gwynifred rose to go. She had promised her father to get back for their usual set of tennis before changing for dinner. Would Quarnian like to come too? Pick up Benji at the vicarage on the way and make up a four? Quarnian would. The lady from Merchester went too to catch the bus. Five minutes later, Mr. Chatford gave, as it were, quite casual expression to the topic uppermost in the bosoms of those remaining. It was strange that you should have mentioned Mrs. Bickley just now, Miss Peavy, he remarked. I had rather meditated raising the subject myself, or rather the subject of Dr. Bickley. I agree, said Miss Wapsworthy with tight lips. It's high time it was raised. Yes? Mr. Chatford appeared faintly puzzled. I haven't seen him once since my marriage. I wanted to ask after him. No doubt you ladies will be able to tell me. How is he bearing the loss of his wife? Miss Peavy and Miss Wapsworthy both looked towards Mrs. Tor. Well, said that lady carefully, I think as well as one could have expected. Indeed. I'm glad. A very tragic affair. The coroner, I thought, handled it most tactfully. Very, almost snapped Miss Wapsworthy. I was particularly glad, pursued Mr. Chatford, with the air of one merely making conversation, that none of the, uh, shall we say, gossip, which I understand had been coupled with Dr. Bickley's name previously, came up in court. No doubt it had never reached the coroner's ears at all. But if it had, I thought it quite right of him to disregard it. Gossip? queried Mrs. Tor with interest. Then? Hadn't there been a certain amount of talk about Dr. Bickley's perhaps rather indiscreet friendships in the neighbourhood? replied Mr. Chatford smoothly. Quite harmless friendships, no doubt, but for a man in his position, at least indiscreet. Oh, yes. Well, that is yes. I believe they had. Names, even, had been mentioned. Names have frequently been mentioned in connection with Dr. Bickley, remarked Miss Wapsworthy acidly. Yes, yes, so I feared. No doubt you ladies know who's. Mrs. Tor, who was not clever at hiding her feelings, looked uncomfortable. From her daughter she had at one time frequently heard Ivy's name mentioned in this connection. She glanced at Ivy, 
and were shocked to see how white the child's face had gone. So there had been something in it then, something rather serious to account for such apprehension. What an unpleasant man Dr. Bickley did seem turning out to be, if only half the things people said about him were true, and she used to think him so nice. To save Ivy, she plunged for something definite. I... I've certainly heard Mrs. Denny Bourne, uh, Madeline Cranmere, as she was, I've certainly heard her name coupled with Dr. Bickley's. Well, I mean, uh, Mrs. Tor tried to soften this slander. They were close friends about then, I believe, though, of course, she didn't see so much of him after she got engaged to Denny. Yes. Ah, oh, yes. Wasn't the engagement announced on the very day of Mrs. Bickley's death? Yes. A most curious coincidence. Do have some of my orange cake, Mr. Chatford, implored Miss Peavy. I made it myself, so I can thank you. I will. And, Ivy, you're eating nothing. I finished, thank you, Miss Peavy. Don't tell me you're going in for this fashionable dieting, too. I do think it's so very... <laughs> and really, Ivy, there's no need for you to... Uh... Oh, no, I'm not. Ivy smiled wanly. Miss Peavy would have liked to keep the conversation on such an innocuous topic, but Mr. Chatford, it seemed, had not finished with the other. He brushed the thread, dangled by Miss Peavy, unobtrusively but firmly aside. Yes, I'd heard that too. Miss Cranmere, as she was. But I understand uh, that there was someone else previous to her. Perhaps you've heard that too. Ivy's eyes flickered in appeal over the three faces. It was not necessary. With a rigid sex loyalty of women, all three denied vigorously having heard of a friend of Dr. Bickley's previous to Miss Cranmere, though all three knew perfectly well who that friend was reputed to have been. Even Miss Peavy, who never listened to gossip if she could help it, knew that. One does not have to listen to gossip in a place like Wyvern's Cross. It inserts itself into the consciousness somehow, quite irrespective of the ears. No, said Miss Wapsworthy, frowning in an effort of memory. No, I never heard of anyone else. Who was it, Mr. Chatford? Oh, I don't know her name, said Mr. Chatford smoothly. And if he realised that three female breaths were being drawn the more easily, he did not show it. Possibly she never existed. I just heard that there had been another woman. But you know what the gossip is in these small places. All three ladies did know it, and looked accordingly deprecatory. Curious, said Mr. Chatford. Miss Peavy caught the look in Ivy's blue eyes, and, like Mrs. Tor a moment ago, plunged for something definite. Oh, I know it was Miss Cranmere. Why, I, I remember one day, uh, really, it was most extraordinary. I, I've never been so insulted in my life. Without quite knowing how it had happened, Miss Peavy found herself embarked on the story of Dr. Bickley's visit to her the previous spring. She had never quite forgiven his conduct then, though she had overlooked it on their subsequent meetings, but she had never told a single person about it. Now, as soon as she had got well started, she wished she had done nothing of the sort. But it was too late to recant. Well, I never, said Mrs. Tor, suitably impressed. Dear me, said Mr. Chatford, most injudicious. And you never said a word about it to me, accused Miss Wapsworthy, and Miss Peavy looked her guilt. Ivy said nothing, but went on playing aimlessly with one of her expensive gloves, pulling it again and again through a loosely clenched fist. Mrs. Tor, in an overflow of maternal feeling, thought she looked just like a child dressed up. It was ridiculous to think of her as the wife of that dry stick, Mr. Chatford. Why, there must be over twenty years between them. 
Did she really love him? Well, there's no need to wonder who the married man was, Adela, observed Miss Wopsworthy. You know perfectly well it was the scandal of the place last summer. Mrs. Tor shook her head. I'm afraid it was. I confess, mused Mr. Chatford, that I had not realised how close the uh, friendship must have been. The slightest stress on the word in question enclosed it in inverted commas. There was a moment's silence while great issues hung in the balance. Close enough, said Miss Wopsworthy, slowly and deliberately, to turn Julia Bickley into a drug fiend. Mr. Chatford looked at her searchingly. I don't quite follow. Oh, it's nothing, Mr. Chatford, said Miss Peavy, much distressed. Just a silly idea of Janet. Really, Janet. I mean, that sort of thing. Well, it isn't very nice, is it? Saying that sort of thing. We're not considering a nice sort of thing, Miss Wopsworthy returned grimly. I'll put it another way then, Mr. Chatford. I'd known Julia Bickley for nearly ten years, and I'd be prepared to say with my dying breath that she was the last person in the whole world to give way to any weakness of that sort. There. Then what? said Mr. Chatford quietly. Are you suggesting, Miss Wopsworthy, in view of the evidence? I suggest nothing. I merely feel that I've done my duty in telling you that, and in adding that Mr. Tor, too, was not satisfied with the verdict at the inquest. Oh, really, Janet, fluttered Mrs. Tor, I don't think you should, uh, you really haven't quite the right to, uh, to, uh, right, said Miss Wopsworthy enigmatically, is right. "'What is it you want me to do, Miss Wopsworthy?' Mr. Chatford asked bluntly. "'Oh, I don't want you to do anything. You're a solicitor. You know whether you should do anything or not. I'm sure I don't. I simply feel that I have rid my shoulders of a responsibility which they are most competent to support by telling you those two things. Who had laid the responsibility on the shoulders in question, Miss Wopsworthy did not add.' I see. Mr. Chatford uncrossed his knees and leant forward. Might I ask for another cup of this excellent tea, Miss Peavy? The subject appeared to be closed. On their way back to Merchester, some twenty minutes later, Mr. Chatford turned to his wife. So, your pretty story is all over Wyvern's Cross. As I expected. Ivy began to tremble. Oh, William, I, I don't think it is, really. They they all said they were lying. Do you think I can't tell when a woman's lying or not? You ought to know whether I can, my dear Ivy. Mrs. Tor gave it away with every muscle of her face. Ivy said nothing. No doubt they're all talking about it now. Charming for me, isn't it? His voice held no tone of anger. Mr. Chatford was never angry. But his dry sarcasm could lacerate Ivy like a knout. Laughing, no doubt. To think how I've been fobbed off with another man's discarded mistress for a wife. Taken in like any schoolboy. Most amusing, isn't it? Oh, William, don't, please. Well, they didn't cut you at any rate. I suppose we have that to be thankful for. Your clothes, no doubt. I always said it paid to be well dressed, didn't I? They drove on a mile or two in silence. And now, what's all this about that late lover of yours, eh? Nasty innuendos. What had they been saying before we arrived, I wonder? That Wopsworthy woman's got something up her sleeve. Tore too, it seems. What do you know about it, Ivy, eh? He shot the question at her suddenly. No, nothing. I, I don't understand. Oh, you don't understand, don't you, my dear? 
just as you didn't understand that if I'd known what you'd been before I asked you to marry me, I wouldn't have looked at you again, eh? Oh, William, please don't bring that all up again. The facile tears crowded into Ivy's eyes. You know how sorry I am for... for deceiving you. No doubt it was because you loved me so much. I do love you, William, I do. If you'd only let me. No, you don't, he replied with unusual fierceness. You still love Bickley. I don't, she sobbed. Truly, I don't. My God, if I thought you did, said her husband quite quietly, staring ahead through the windscreen. There was another little interlude of silence, broken only by Ivy's sniffs. Ivy, Mr. Chatford said, not unkindly, tell me this. I've never asked you before, but it does make a difference. Were you quite innocent when Bickley seduced you? Ivy caught desperately at the tone. Yes, quite, I swear. Ignorant? Yes, yes. Mr. Chatford stared ahead. William, that does make a difference, doesn't it? Her husband patted her knees. His dry skin scraped on the silk. It may make all the difference to Dr. Bickley, he said, without apparent emotion. Ivy turned terrified eyes on him, opened her mouth, and then hastily turned her head away. Chapter 9 Dr. Bickley helped himself to another glass of port. Since Julia died, he had been able to afford these little luxuries. He was thinking of his roses. The two Marcia Stanhopes had flowered unexpectedly freely last year. He wished he had ordered a couple more last autumn. Still, the white ensigns he had put in instead would be more reliable. The rose garden would be better than ever this year. It was quite a pity Julia would not be there to see it. The rose garden was one of the few points of contact they had possessed. Poor Julia. Really, thought Dr. Bickley for the thousandth time, it had been a merciful release. Her life had never been happy. She was probably most grateful to him by now, wherever she was. He lit another cigarette and lounged more comfortably in his chair. The open book on his knee slipped aside. Nine o'clock, work finished, and a pleasant, long evening by the fire, all alone. That was the best of early June. One could still enjoy a fire in the evening. He was not in the least lonely. He never did feel so. Dr. Bickley was not one of those who rely entirely upon human companionship for their enjoyment. Nearly thirteen months now. Of late, he noticed with interest, the thought of Julia had been less and less present in his mind. Imperceptibly, he was slipping back to the state of things before he met her. Julia, instead of being his life, was taking on the aspect of an interlude, an interlude too firmly and courageously terminated when it became impossible. That Dr. Bickley had been a different man since Julia's death, he himself had been the first to recognise. It was extraordinary how that one action had altered his idea of himself. Somehow he could not help feeling that he had vindicated his existence, proved once and for all that he was as capable as anyone else of taking his own line and sticking to it grimly, more capable. What was the phrase? Something, 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 and captain of his soul. That was it, exactly. Captain of his soul. Poor Julia. How she would have hated being thought of as a mere interlude. But the interlude had held vital lessons for him. No more marriage, and no more women. One captain of his soul was enough, and that not a female one. Women! Good Lord! 
What an escape he had had with Madeleine. He had never been so grateful to anyone in his life as he was now to Denny. Julia had been right there. He had seen through her in the end. Good God, what a bitch! Just amusing herself. It had been perfectly true. Amusing herself with other people's deepest and most genuine feelings, dragging them in her own muck like the filthy little emotional mudlark she was. How he had been taken in, but what an escape! Poor Julia. Poor Denny. Already there were rumours. They were living apart. They were contemplating divorce after eight months. Madeleine's hysterical tendencies were developing to the verge of mental unbalance. That, Dr. Bickley could quite believe, the two were seldom seen in Wyvern's Cross now. Yes, poor Denny. How could he, at inexperienced twenty-four, expect to cope with all the failings of the female temperament concentrated and multiplied a hundredfold in one damnable example? Village gossip had condemned such a youthful marriage. Denny's insistence on its early performance and the Bourne's weak acquiescence, and for once, village gossip had been right. No, no more women. They weren't to be trusted, not one of them. A man should belong to himself, not to some complacent female bear leader. Dr. Bickley had found at last what he had been looking for for the last ten years. The girl he really should have married. And that was no girl at all. Thank God for freedom, he thought, and toasted its spirit in another sip of five and sixpenny port. Ah, well, reminiscing is a bad thing. He picked up his fallen book and began to read. The idea of being found out never entered his head, except for one or two attacks of futile panic round about the time of the inquest it never had. Why should it? Nothing could ever be proved. Nothing could ever even be found out. There never had been the remotest possibility. There had been a certain amount of inevitable gossip, of course, but even that... Dr. Bickley, for the time abnormally sensitive to atmosphere, had diagnosed as centering around Julia and her enormity. His practice had fallen off a little too, but that was to be expected. Now it was nearly back to normal again. He had always been safe. But now the question of safety had almost ceased to apply. There was nothing to be safe about, or the reverse. Dr. Bickley had practically forgotten that he had ever committed murder, except, of course, in so far as it reflected credit on himself. The telephone bell rang, and with a muttered curse he went to answer it. The instrument was in his consulting room, and out of long habit he shut the door before lifting the receiver, though there was not even anyone else in the house. Florence and the cook had gone, and a woman came in from the village now, daily. Hello, is that Dr. Bickley? Yes, who is it? This is Ivy speaking. Teddy, I must see you. Can you be at, at our old place at three o'clock tomorrow? Really, Ivy, Dr. Bickley expostulated. Now you're married, I don't think. Oh, it isn't that. Ivy sounded tearful as usual, and yet urgent, too. She spoke in little gasps. This is terribly important. You must come. Something awful. What? Dr. Bickley's voice became suddenly sharp. I can't tell you now. Not possibly. Something... No, I can't. But you'll be there tomorrow? Yes. Three o'clock. Without fail? Yes, without fail. He rang off. What the devil was the matter with Ivy now? Anyhow, he had done with women. Definitely. Ivy was late, by nearly twenty minutes. She drove her car in unskillfully, shaving one side of the entrance. 
Dr. Bickley took the wheel from her and drove it into the undergrowth beside his own, out of sight, while Ivy apologised. It was William's car. She was not supposed to drive it. She hardly knew how to, and that was why she was so late. She would not have dared to bring it at all, but William had gone to London, and Dr. Bickley groaned in spirit. William had gone to London, and Ivy had demanded a rendezvous directly his back was turned. Was he never to be done with women? They climbed up to the Eyrie, Ivy throwing fearful glances towards the entrance of the quarry. Evidently she was terrified of being seen. Dr. Bickley, clambering up behind her, noted her appearance at any rate with approval. Ivy certainly did look smart. Like the rest of Wyvern's Cross, Dr. Bickley had hardly seen her since her emigration to Merchester. Unlike the rest of Wyvern's Cross, he had hardly thought of her. He was surprised that she had changed so little. It was absurd to think of her as married, and to Chatford. And really, she was looking prettier than ever. Hang it all, she was wasted on Chatford. What did Chatford know to appreciate a pretty girl? And obviously, she was still fond of himself. Hence the rendezvous at the first opportunity. Rather touching when one came to think of it. Thank goodness he hadn't married her himself. But Ivy married to someone else. Ivy, as a married woman, might provide her with the spice of interest which Ivy, unmarried, had so notably lacked. Well, 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 there might be possibilities after all. Dr. Bickley arrived at the top of the ascent in a very different mood from that in which he had begun it. They disappeared inside. The new Dr. Bickley did not hesitate where the old one might have done, even with Ivy. He took her in his arms at once. She made some small effort to struggle, more with herself than with him. Oh, no, Teddy, you mustn't. I'm married now. Oh, Teddy, please, let me go. But almost before he could have complied, her arms were round his neck, and she was straining frantically to him. Ivy... Dear girl. Oh, Teddy, do you still love me? Really? Oh, do say you do. He said it. They kissed. No, Ivy hadn't altered, Dr. Bickley mused. But he thought of her as Chatford's wife, and that made her more amusing. Look, darling, there's our old couch still there. Do you remember? The divan? Let's sit on it. Oh, no, Teddy, we mustn't. Not now. No, don't. He drew her down onto it beside him. After the barest show of conventional resistance, she yielded. Dear little Ivy, he really was rather fond of her, and it was nice to be so openly adored. At least in small and infrequent doses it was. He took her hands in his and peeled off her gloves, then pulled off her hat and ran his fingers with complacent proprietorship through her soft, fair curls. Ivy let him do as he liked with her. It dawned on him that her thoughts were very much elsewhere. She did not respond, nor was there any answering amorousness in her blue eyes. She did not seem even to be noticing what he was doing. Penny for your thoughts, dear, he said jocularly. The look she turned on him was so unexpected that he stiffened in his attitude of the moment. It was one of blank terror. He remembered her words on the telephone and read into them a more literal significance than he had credited to them before. What had Chatford been doing to her? Ivy, what's the matter? Something's wrong. Tell me, dear. She moistened her lips. I hardly know how to. It's terrible, Teddy. Dreadful. What is? 
This was something serious. He had never seen Ivy look like this. William's gone to London to... to... Good heavens! Not run away from you, has he? Left you? No, no! It's about you, Teddy. She began to shiver violently. Me? he said in astonishment. You mean... He's gone to London about me? She nodded. Good heavens, what for? On business, do you mean? But he isn't my solicitor. What on earth do you mean, Ivy? Her lips were shaking so much she could hardly frame the words. He's gone to Scotland Yard. A sharp pain struck sharply through the left side of Dr. Bickley's chest, just as if it had been pierced by a long pin. It was followed immediately by a dull, sickly ache. He stared at Ivy in plain panic, his mouth open, his eyes filmed with terror. Oh! Ivy whispered and shrank away from him. Her movement roused him to pull himself together. With a literal, physical effort, he forced obedience on shaking limbs and quivering nerves. Ivy must not guess. Scotland Yard, he repeated, huskily but fairly evenly. Good heavens, what for? Bit by bit, Ivy, amid tears, divulged her news. It was the awful, wicked gossip that had been going round ever since Mrs. Bickley died. Teddy didn't know. Oh, yes, it had. Nothing definite had been said, but the circumstances had been considered queer, and it had been hinted that quite a different story lay behind the verdict which Dr. Bickley could tell if he chose. Am I to understand that Wyvern's Cross has been accusing me of murdering Julia? Dr. Bickley asked disgustedly. The news of this gossip was a complete revelation to him. Lot of damned old cats. He'd like to do something to the lot of them. Oh, no, nothing so awful as that. But coming, as Mrs. Bickley's death had, right in the middle of all the talk there had been about the doctor and that Miss Cranmere, well, Teddy had already been on the main news page and had simply and inevitably been promoted to its leading column, so to speak. From a star of scandal, he had become a complete constellation. But only the vaguest hints had been dropped as to cause and effect. Then, apparently, the whole simmering pot had boiled up at a tea party at Miss Peavy's about a fortnight ago into something very like plain speech. Miss Wopsworthy had been the leading spirit, seconded ably by Mrs. Tor. In the ordinary course, it would just have been the usual letting off of feminine steam. But by a misfortune of misfortunes, William had been there too and heard it all. And what is delightful gossip to a village worthy, implied Ivy, is a deadly piece of seriousness to a solicitor. He had gone back to Wyvern's Cross to talk to Mr. Tor about it the very next day. Why, Mr. Tor? Because Mrs. Tor had said that her husband had not been altogether satisfied with the inquest last year. Blast the silly old hag! burst out Dr. Bickley, uncontrollably, white with rage. Of all the... Couldn't Chatford see it was all just the aimless chatter of these damned old women? with nothing else to do but spread scandalous stories about their neighbours. Couldn't he see that? Well, you see, said Ivy, timidly, he... he hates you so, Teddy. I think you ought to know that. Hates me? Good heavens, I've... I've never done anything to him. Why should he hate me? Why, because... because... My God, Ivy! You didn't tell him about us. You did, you damned little fool. Ivy's tears fell thicker and faster. I knew you'd be angry, but I couldn't help it. He got it out of me. You don't know what he's like. He, he knew I wasn't good, and I tried not to tell him, Teddy. I, I swear I did. And you don't know what he's like. On and on. All right, Ivy. There was no good in losing his temper with the little fool. 
You must keep calm. Calm. As long as he didn't frighten or antagonize her, Ivy was an invaluable ally, a spy in Chatford's dirty underhand cap. As long as she thought he loved her, she would... All right, dear. He forced himself to smile, instead of hitting her in the face again as he longed to do, and this time go on hitting her. Don't cry. I quite see how it happened. And anyhow, it's done now. No wonder he hates me. And so he's going out of his way to stir up this silly mare's nest, eh? Well, that's all right. Scotland Yard wouldn't listen to him for a minute, of course, even if he goes there at all. Probably he only said that to frighten you. He can't be such a fool. And even if they did, two minutes' conversation would clear the whole thing up. Would it? said Ivy, brightening. Then you don't think it's serious? Serious? Good gracious me, no. How could anything so utterly ridiculous be serious? His own words were already reassuring Dr. Bickley. This might be an infernal nuisance, but it could hardly be serious. Why, it simply makes me laugh, that's all. Oh, Teddy, it's wonderful of you to take it like that, dear. I feel so ashamed of William. Dr. Bickley actually did laugh, genuinely. <laughs> Don't you see, when they hear the circumstances, he pointed out eagerly, that it's just a case of retrospective jealousy towards the wife's former lover... That'll rob anything he has to tell them of nine-tenths of its value. <laughs> They'd see through it at once. Just an insane idea of revenge. But, Teddy, you wouldn't tell them that. What? About the... the lover. It would be giving me away completely, wouldn't it? My dear Ivy said Dr. Bickley with some impatience. I don't intend to hang in order to shield your good name. That may be the sort of thing they do in books, but in real life it'd be a bit too much. Oh, don't, shuddered Ivy. Don't talk about hanging. It... it makes me feel dreadful. Silly darling, Dr. Bickley soothed her, and she clung to him as frantically as if his death warrant had been actually signed. Dr. Bickley did not want to be amorous any more for the moment. He wanted the history of Chatford's activities to date. Between perfunctory caresses, he got it. Chatford had begun by interviewing Mr. Tor. Mr. Tor had had nothing definite to say beyond a vague feeling that the bare facts, as presented in the coroner's court, were improbable. And if they were true, there must be others to explain them which whether for good or for bad reasons, had been concealed. That was all he had meant in expressing dissatisfaction with the proceedings. The coroner had not probed deep enough. Chatford had not told Ivy much about this interview, but he had added that the two had discussed Mrs. Bickley's character, which, of course, Mr. Tor knew a good deal more intimately than Chatford himself, and had arrived at the conclusion that as she must be considered the most unlikely person in the world to give way to such weakness as habitual drug-taking, the apparent cause of this, her headaches, ought to be investigated a good deal more fully. That she had suffered from headaches of the most violent description during the last months of her life had been no secret to her friends. Even with her strength of will, she could not have concealed them. But the cause had been passed over very lightly in court. Sir Tamerton Folliot's name had been mentioned, but he had not given evidence. Chatford intended to see him. But what's the man getting at? Dr. Bickley asked, puzzled. How is all this going to help anything? What really is in Chatford's mind? Ivy told him. Chatford and Mr. Tor and Miss Wapsworthy, all of them suspected something horrible that Mrs. Bickley had taken the overdose of morphia deliberately, driven to it 
by her husband's scandalous affair with Madeleine Cranmere. They believe that Julia committed suicide, said Dr. Bickley half incredulously. Well, Ivy couldn't say definitely that they believed. They believed in the possibility. And William was determined to drag it all up so that Dr. Bickley's name should be utterly discredited and he would have to leave Wyvern's Cross forever. Dr. Bickley almost laughed out loud in his relief. So murder was not even in question at all. Why couldn't the little idiot have said so at once instead of frightening him like that? How funny! He'd never once thought of Julia's death being put down to suicide. It was so utterly unlike her. Mr. Tor, as an amateur psychologist, was pretty good. Dr. Bickley questioned Ivy further. Sir Tamerton Folliot was not the only person Chatford intended to interview in London. Madeleine Bourne was there, if not her husband. Chatford was determined to get to the bottom of that affair. There, really, he had hinted to Ivy, was the crux. If Dr. Bickley had been as serious in his feelings as Wyvern's Cross had believed, though clearly Madeleine had not been, then Mrs. Bickley undoubtedly had a strong motive for suicide. Chatford believed he could get an idea from Madeleine how serious he had been. Dr. Bickley stroked his chin. Madeleine would have no hesitation in giving him away. Of that he was certain. Ever since the day of her engagement, she had seemed to take a debased delight in prattling of the affair to anyone who would listen, and naturally there had been plenty of willing ears. It had done him a lot of harm in the place undoubtedly, and it was to that, rather than to Julia's death, that he had attributed the falling off of his practice last year. But even if she did give him away completely to Chatford, what did it matter? It was only her word against his, and Dr. Bickley rather fancied that if it came to the point, he could discredit Madeleine's word pretty adequately. To prove she was a hysterical subject would be simple. From that to delusions with the merest of steps. And it would be rather delightful to show up Madeleine for the unpleasant thing she really was. Poor Denny. But, but what about Scotland Yard? I thought you said he was going there. Where does that come in? Yes, he was. If these interviews, combined with the information from Wyvern's Cross, did show there was a case for investigation, he was going to Scotland Yard to lay it before the police. They'll laugh at him, pronounced Dr. Bickley with conviction. What does it matter to anyone now whether poor Julia died by accident or killed herself? It may matter to Chatford, of course, if he could get me drummed out of the place, but it certainly won't matter to the police. Dirty hound, to try and get his revenge through blackening a dead woman's name. But, Teddy, aren't you worried? My dear girl, there's nothing to worry about. Of course Julia never committed suicide. That idea's absurd. But of course, too, the authorities won't let your precious husband stir up all this mud over nothing. Naturally, I'm not worried. I know I should be. Well, I'm not. Besides, this is no time for worry, darling, with you here again. Quite like old times, isn't it? Glad to be back. Oh, Teddy, you know I am. Are you? Really, really? You bet I am. You're prettier than ever, Ivy. And aren't you smart too nowadays? I like your hat. And real silk stockings. Real silk all through, I expect, Mrs. Chetford, eh? Oh, no. Teddy, you mustn't. No. Not now I'm married. It isn't fair. Really, Dr. Bickley, I'm surprised at you. Oh, Teddy... An hour later, they parted. Dr. Bickley smiled to himself as he drove home. Chatford's activities could really not be taken seriously, and it amused him to have had his revenge on them so promptly. 
Ivy became invaluable. She kept Dr. Bickley informed of everything she knew and questioned her husband closely on his behalf. As it was impossible for her to use the car after Chatford's return from London, they arranged a rendezvous in Merchester itself, where they met in secrecy and safety regularly twice a week. On Dr. Bickley's instructions, Ivy adopted a subtle line. She pretended to Chatford that she hated Dr. Bickley now and was as anxious as himself to see him driven out of Wyvern's Cross. In this way, she got him to part with a good deal more information than he would have divulged to an unsympathetic inquirer. Dr. Bickley thus learnt that Chatford, while getting very little change out of Sir Tamerton Folliot, had got a great deal out of Madeleine Bourne, though mostly small. Enough, at any rate, to justify in his opinion the visit to Scotland Yard. Dr. Bickley was most interested in this visit and questioned Ivy thoroughly about it, giving her further questions to put to Chatford later. However, it all amounted to very little more than that Chatford had been received without any great enthusiasm, had seen a chief inspector to whom he had told his story, and had been advised, not without severity, that Scotland Yard could not move in the matter as he should have known, it being outside their province, and, if he was really of the opinion that anything was to be gained by investigation, he had better lay his facts before the proper authorities, who were the Devonshire County Police. Altogether, chuckled Dr. Bickley with malicious glee, not a very successful interview. Chatford laid his information before the county authorities. He was more reticent with Ivy as to the result of that interview. But Dr. Bickley was not perturbed. It was all too ridiculous, except for a growing anger with Chatford and his presumption, and annoyance over the bother that might be caused him, his emotions were not affected. That it would ever come to an inquiry was impossible to believe, and even if it did, nothing more serious could happen and that he might be censured for negligence in allowing Julia to have access to the morphia after he had discovered her propensities. But it was a nuisance, and Chatford was getting intolerable. Dr. Bickley took pleasure in gratifying his hatred by reinstating a none too unwilling Ivy as his regular mistress. Chatford should pay that price for his damned interference. Not long afterwards, a strange man from Exeter was to be seen pottering about in Wyvern's Cross and chatting casually with the inhabitants. Dr. Bickley observed his activities with nothing but amusement mixed with contempt. A lot of good he could do collecting village gossip. And, besides, the villagers all liked him, and they had not liked Julia. Dr. Bickley thought humorously of writing to Exeter to protest as a ratepayer, against this waste of time and expense. The strange man disappeared, and that, it seemed, was the end of that. It was now getting well on in July, and Dr. Bickley looked forward to a peaceful remainder of the summer. But there is never any harm in adding the final touch or two that makes a masterpiece, and one incident particularly pleased him. Teddy... Ivy said artlessly one day. You never told me you once actually asked Madeleine to marry you. The Madeleine theme was a favourite one with Ivy. She loved to question and cross-question him on it, demanding every detail of their intercourse, taking delight in reviving the anguish she had suffered over it, and, unknowingly, his too. Dr. Bickley wished she wouldn't. He did not want to discuss it at all. "'Didn't I?' he said gruffly, shying, as always, at the mention of this unwelcome name. "'But you did ask her. "'So she's blabbed that too, has she?' "'Yes. She told William, and he told me. "'Do tell me about it, Teddy. "'You must have had a hectic scene from what she says. "'And fancy, only an hour or so after I saw you that day in the road, do you remember?' "'Oh, Teddy!' 
I do think you might have told me. What did she say, really? And all the time... Teddy, you're not listening. Dr. Bickley turned from the window. Her words had reminded him of something he had been intending to put to her. Ivy, he said, very distinctly, as to a small child. You know when you did meet me that afternoon, I asked you the time? Yes. You told me it was twenty to three, didn't you? Did I? Yes, I believe I did. Did you ever find out you were nearly a quarter of an hour fast? No, I don't remember. Well, you were. It put me in rather a hole. I was late for a most important appointment. I put in another visit first, thinking I'd got a quarter of an hour more than I had, and it made me late. Did it really? I'm awfully sorry, Teddy. Fancy remembering that. Yes, said Dr. Bickley still more distinctly. When you saw me that afternoon, the time was really twenty-five past two. He had always remembered that just after twenty past two, he had passed two of the villagers, as he turned into the very road where he had left the car. You'd better remember that. Yes, I will, darling. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. But, well, I suppose you told Chatford about meeting me that afternoon? No, I don't think I have. I'm sure I haven't. He never asked me. Well, he didn't know, so he couldn't, could he? But I'd nearly forgotten all about it myself, as a matter of fact. Yes, so had I. It just occurred to me. Well, if by any chance it ever is mentioned, remember that it was twenty-five past two, not twenty to three. I shouldn't say anything about your watch being fast. No need for complications. Just say that when I asked you for the time, you looked at your watch and told me it was twenty-five past two. All right, Teddy, I'll remember. Dr. Bickley smiled on her. How fortunate that Ivy was Ivy. Has Chatford told you anything lately, by the way? No, not for a long time now, Teddy. Dr. Bickley kissed her affectionately. That Chatford was getting more and more reticent with Ivy could be interpreted in only one way. He had nothing to tell. But Dr. Bickley's hatred of him did not diminish, if anything, it increased. Dr. Bickley had never hated before in his life. Now he hated two people, Chatford and Madeleine. Chatford the more virulently, but Madeleine the more deeply, with a sick, disgusted loathing. He felt that he had been more humiliated by Madeleine than ever by Julia. Madeleine had taken his most sacred feelings, the most genuine, honest feelings he had ever had, and danced on them. She had exploited every atom of his soul for the gratification of her own unbalanced emotions. And, not content with that, she had, in her astonishing unreticence, taken a perverted delight in slandering him. Dr. Bickley knew very well the story that she had been so assiduously putting about, without the slightest provocation, whitewashing her own mean little soul by blackening his that she, the white flower of trusting innocence, had had her heart besieged by a professional seducer, who, by his appalling lies and unscrupulous skill, had succeeded in gaining temporary possession of that organ. But Madeline, coming to her senses just in time, the scales were ripped from her eyes as if by the direct hand of Providence, and the desperate fellow was sent promptly to the right about. Some version of this story Madeleine had busily poured into all the important ears of the neighbourhood. The Bournes, the Tours, Mrs. Hatton Hampsteads, any she could find. And though, of course, she nobly refrained from mentioning a name in connection with it, Dr. Bickley had found himself, for a time, eyed very coldly indeed. 
he could still not think of Madeleine without trembling with rage. Denny he no longer honoured by hating. He merely despised that poor creature now. Denny, with his prospective title and eight thousand a year, of course deserved the love of any pure woman. Ivy was the only one to benefit directly by her lover's present detestation of her late rival. Returning to her after the other, with a celibate pause between, to allow things to fall a little into perspective, Dr. Bickley inevitably compared the two, and his revulsion of feeling from the latter was enabling him now to appreciate Ivy at a true worth she had not got. 